think about the reality that many people in the world today have little belief or no belief, and they meander through life without any real purpose at all. No sense of driving significance, no ambition, no passion, just going through the motions and just waiting, basically, until their time is up. And what Joan of Arc has to say is, hey, that's kind of sad, that's pathetic, it's worse to die without any cause than it is to die young. It's way better to die young with a purpose than to float through life without any real driving passion, no belief at all. And unfortunately, that's the way many people can be in the world today, and that's the, what we want to be careful about in terms of the way that we respond to the gospel, that we aren't going to be classified in that same kind of group that Joan of Arc was describing. Tim Elmore was talking about the pathway to convictions. How do we get to this place where convictions are really going to mold us and shape us and transform us into the people that God would want us to be? And what he says is this. There's a different levels as we go from step one to step five in this process. The first level is that of ideas. When we are first introduced to an idea, we perceive the issue by the way we think about it, and this involves our minds. It starts floating around. In our mind, it hasn't really sunk in, hasn't really grabbed hold. It's basically just at the idea stage. It's just a concept in our minds. But number two, we recognize that eventually ideas can become opinions. That's when we begin to express our preferences on the issue. And now our emotions are beginning to get involved. We've gone through ideas. Now we're moving on to opinions. From there, we go to step three. In step three, we see beliefs. Here's where we begin to conclude, where we stand on the issue. This involves our mind, this involves our emotions on a little bit deeper level. It's beginning to sink in, it's beginning to take root in us, but we go from there to step four. In step four, we have commitments. In commitments, we begin to act on our belief, because now we've got the mind involved, we've got the emotions, but now we've got the will. Now our decisions are being driven by the, these ideas, and now we've got commitments, so this is something that we're going to take a little more seriously, but the challenge for you and for me is to get to level five. Level five is what we see in terms of convictions. At this point, we are ready to die for our commitment because it is a driving passion in our lives. That's the pathway to convictions, and that's what you and I are called to be like in terms of our response to the gospel. Not just a simple idea, but a full-fledged conviction so that we are ready to die for this commitment because it is a driving passion in our lives. The believers here in Thessalonica, that's exactly the way they responded. When they encountered the gospel, they got to that point of convictions. We recognize that. They went way beyond these ideas and opinions. You and I are called to follow that same example in terms of the way that we respond to the gospel of Christ. And we can look at the Thessalonians example, and we can see perfect evidence of how it is that they made this transition, and we can see proof of how we know they were living the way that God would want them to live. Because what we recognize in verse 9, as we pull this up on the screen, this is what we see. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you, can y'all read these next five words with me? How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. We know that they were at this stage of convictions because this was the process. They turned to God from idols. That is a huge step to take, and that is very telling as to the extent of their commitment there. An idol, what we see is anything that we worship in the place of God. It's something that we value. It's something that consumes our thoughts, our attention, our schedule, our money, our energy, whatever it is that we're going after full force. If there's anything that, we co that comes in between us and God in terms of really capturing our full devotion, then that thing has become an idol for us. What's really sad is that we see an example of this in Romans chapter 1. Paul is talking about the people in that civilization at that time, and he talks about this idea that these people had actually exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They had the opportunity, they knew the truth, they saw the truth, they could recognize the truth, but instead they said, no thanks, I don't want truth. Instead, I'm going to push truth to the side, and I'm going to live for a lie. Exchange the truth of God for a lie, and get this, the result of that was that they served not the creator, but creatures, created things. They set themselves up to fail and to go to a much lower level in terms of what they were living for. What's crazy is that we have the opportunity to follow truth. We have the opportunity to worship and serve our creator. And sometimes we exchange that truth and we go after a lie. 
And as we're going after lives, we start serving created things. We start serving creatures rather than the creator himself. And that's what puts us in a bad place, taking us off track, away from God. Tim Keller, he's a pastor, he's an author, written a lot of great books. This is what he has to say on the subject. He's talking about this idea that man was made as the highest form of creation to rule, to have dominion over the earth. But sadly, when idols come into play, this is what we see. Instead of living for God, he says, we began to live for ourselves or our work or for material goods. We reversed the original intended order. And we, when we began to worship and serve created things, paradoxically, the created things came to rule over us. Instead of being God's vice regents ruling over creation, now creation masters us. That's a sad state of affairs.